to um, welcome the group this evening. I'm real pleased to see many of you able to come out as have. I've uh, had quite an interesting afternoon as I spent part of it with the Aspies. In fact, it was a real pleasure when I arrived at the airport and checked in on the flight, having not arrived yet, and found that uh, Dr. Aspie's flight had come along. And as I have been getting acquainted with her, I find that uh, she's every bit as much a PhD as her husband is. I am uh, gathering information to prepare myself for this activity. I found sufficient to uh, keep me going for quite some time. In fact, uh, probably take your place <laughs> if I read the uh, the data that is before me. But I have uh, summarized it a little bit. And uh, starting, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Virginia Aspie. She is uh, Director of Nurses in a 550-bed hospital in Washington, D.C. She has also been involved and is involved in as a Director of Nursing Education. So she's been in the field of education as well as a practicing nurse. Her uh, doctorate is in the area of higher education and administration. And as a practicing nurse, she was, uh, her specialty is in the pediatric area. She has been involved also in programs leading to two, three, and four year degrees as far as uh, the nursing profession is concerned. Now, Dr. Aspie, he's been with a lifelong commitment to education. And his specialty is the humanistic approach to education. In other words, the impact the teacher makes upon the classroom setting. And his research is <coughs> in this area. He's a native of Kentucky, having received degrees from the University of Louisville and his doctorate from the University of Kentucky. Dr. Aspie's career started at the secondary school, like many of you and I here in this room, and that soon led to university teaching also. He has served as an associate dean, research director, principal investigator, and consultant. Currently, he is the director of the National Consor Consortium for Humanizing Education and is a research fellow with the Catholic University. For me, it is a real pleasure to introduce Dr. Aspie. He's very personable. As I was visiting with him this evening, they practice what they preach. He uh, has a uh, he's a very personable individual with real insight into this impact of the teacher in the classroom. And not only the insight, but his dedicated commi commitment to the humanistic role of the teacher. With pleasure, the Department of Industrial Education, the College of Education, and the University Committee on Lectures bring you the aspects. Thank you. Uh, I was going to hold the applause beforehand and see if it's worthwhile. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you, John, for the generous introduction. And um, we're going to sit here and talk with you, try not to talk at you too much, about uh, some different kind of approaches, perhaps education. And uh, we're really going to talk about human decency in the classroom, however you spell that out, and about some of the approaches that we have taken. And uh, so we'll just share that with you. Virginia is a able teacher trainer. She has trained in uh, something like 42 states and seven foreign countries, including the Gaza Strip and Israel, both, and that's quite a feat in and of itself. And uh, so as we talk about teacher training, we'll be uh, oscillating back and forth here, and uh, she will be entering her comments. I will. We'll have some things for you to do as we go along, and we'll do some talking so far, okay? Um, there's a lady here I'd like to recognize, uh, Dr. Rippey, here, who uh, went to the same school I did, I won't tell you when, and uh, good to see her, and uh, she looks like the years have done good. Uh, I'm sure those of you who have had her classes enjoy her. Did you stick up your hand? So think, see, there you go. She's a fine lady from Anchorage, Kentucky, originally. Uh, good to see you. <coughs> Let me turn this on and we'll start. Okay, we'd like for you to, uh, from a theoretical point of view, to take a look at this, <clears throat> to try to explain our educational theory. Take a look at this drawing, then we'll ask you to do some things. 
Number one, we'd like for you to pick the two. There's A, B, and C. And we'd like for you to pick the two that you think fit together. Okay? You say these two most fit together. Okay, you got it? Your own man? Okay, how many people would pick A and B? Anybody? Okay. Did I see the hand out there? Not one? Okay, that's a minority group. Okay. I could ask you how he feels right now at this point. Uh, <laughs> okay, how many people would pick A and C? Say those are the two that belong together. How many people would pick B and C? Okay. Now, how many people are afraid to pick? Uh, <laughs> quite a few things, some kind of trick. Now, what's the right answer? Okay, there ain't no right answer. There are just different ways to see this. And if somebody classified A and B as he did, I could ask him why he classified A and B. Probably there's a variety of reasons we asked him he could tell us why. But we think that education, a theory of education, is that it has to begin with how people see things and start from that frame of reference and begin to develop curricula around it rather than telling people how they ought to see things. And that's what we researched, is education geared toward seeing what people see and beginning uh, education and classroom work from there. Now, to get some perspectives on college teaching, we have done college training and so forth in about 42 states and seven foreign countries and conducted about 16 or 17 years of research. So many of these things we talk about tonight will be the outcomes of that work. Where is college teacher education? Where is it now? Well, we think that trainers have a ready supply of training and a research procedure. That is, we are ready now to take a look at teaching. And most professors are tenured, and that's not exactly true, but most of them are kind of locked in. Now, there's a shortage of jobs around. You can't switch jobs the way you used to. There's a shortage of money, okay? And professors are skeptical about teacher training. So, to sum it up, we say the trainers feel pulled between the opportunities that they have and the constraints of the situation. Now, where do college teacher trainers want to go? That is what would we like to accomplish? Well, we would like to introduce new methods into college teaching. We would like to try training procedures on large populations. That is, many studies that have been done on teaching have been done with relatively small populations, and we would like to expand those studies and do some good systematic studies on large populations. We understand then that teacher training methods are, are in their infancy in a sense because they have not been researched thoroughly. And uh, so we're, we're starting with some rather uh, rudimentary methods, this sort of thing, but we do need research territory. We also need to have data from classrooms, by the way, that uh, professors who will uh, expose their teaching to uh, critiques and this sort of thing and honest to goodness scientific study. Uh, we would like to, to refine our training procedures. We would like to expand the teaching repertoires of all professors. Okay? Now then, what is it that teacher trainers want to accomplish? Well, they want to, in a sense, feel free, to feel released, to make their contribution. Now, what is missing then? What do we need to do? Well, if we look at our problem, and I would like to uh, suggest we can look at any human problem this way, that where we are at the present is that we have procedures that are being used slowly. So in a sense, I guess we feel pregnant, uh, ready to, to deliver in a sense. And uh, what is the future? What are we looking for? Well, we would like to see a widespread use of these procedures that we have. And the thing that is missing, this piece here, is a step-by-step -step procedure by which that can be accomplished. One, two, three, four, five, and so forth. Now, so we have some training procedures that are ready. We have some uh, research that tells us a lot of things. We're ready to go to action. And uh, a lot of times there isn't much action to be had when you're talking about training of college teachers. Now, the, with our work, which has included work in 
in about 42 states and seven foreign countries, so it's involved a lot of colleges. What we have found is that there are a lot of, of high-flown ideas that never get implemented. And that what we have found works most, or works best, is to have simplistic models, to have some very, very simple sorts of things that can be done, that can be done and can be done by, by any person who wants to do them. And rather, than we, we started off with cognitive development using the met <coughs> scale. And it has 1,028 categories for cognitive functioning in a classroom. And we felt pretty good. But we kept getting data on this, and we have tape recorded about 200,000 hours of classroom teaching, and analyzed it every three seconds for its content. And we felt pretty good with, with met scale. We felt dignified. Uh, all those sorts of things, and <coughs> scholarly. And we did a lot of research and we kept collapsing the data. We didn't find what was relating to what. And we finally ended up with two categories that told us something. And one was memory and the other was thinking. And we called all the cognitive activities that go on beyond memory, we just called them thinking, lumped them all together. When we used those two categories, they began to make predictions for us. Now what have we found, generally? We have found this that you have to measure human decency in a classroom across time, as you have to have a, a year's study at least to begin to tell what, what human decency does in a classroom. It doesn't uh, take place overnight. Secondly, that teachers can be trained to become more decent in their classroom interaction. And we talk about decent, we'll, we'll, we'll spell that out in uh, some more detail, but decency can be measured from our point of view. And what I, would, what I would recommend to you is this, is that we can take the measures that we use and make predictions about what will happen in the classroom, or we can make post predictions about what did happen in the classroom and uh, hit with a pretty high degree of accuracy. We found that human decency in a classroom is related to higher test scores, to higher attendance, on and on, and that it consists of skills and not the look in somebody's eye but something that you can teach and something that you can learn. We, in a sense, can learn to become more effective in our human relationships. Now, but we found that we're better to start with some simple measures, some simple procedures. And the one that we have found is good to begin with. Let me tell you, the problem is this. The problem always, for, for most of us, and I've been a teacher for some 30 years now, uh, is that we, we are, are somewhat different in the classroom than we picture ourselves. There's a big difference between the ideal and real self. And that uh, when we begin to take a look at what we do in the classroom and boil it down into its nitty gritty components, that it, it's a little bit shocking to us. So there is uh, some resistance to having a close look at our teaching. And we have found an instrument that helps us is called Flanders Interaction uh, uh, Analysis. Have, have, have you used that or not? Has, has anybody here used Flanders work? Yeah. Okay. All right. Now we have found this instrument to be a very effective instrument and what it tells you essentially is this. How much you talk and how much students talk. Very simply that. That's a very powerful measure. Now this is what the instrument looks like. It tells us this. It tells us, was the teacher talking or did the student talk? It has seven categories for measuring the verbal components in a classroom. Seven categories for teacher talk. Two categories for student talk and one for silence or confusion. Now, when we talk about confusion in class, let me make it clear. Shifting of chairs, shifting of gears, and this sort of thing makes a, it takes time. It has to be done. So we call that silence or confusion. There isn't anything wrong with that. But this, this allows us now to look at a classroom and say, okay, here's what's going on. Now, it doesn't tell a teacher is that good teaching or bad teaching. It simply says this is what's going on. Now, after starting with our complex systems of looking at classroom, we boiled it back down to this instrument, and we found that a very powerful feedback is how much teachers talk versus how much students talk. And we found this. 
But in a typical classroom in this world, not just in this country, but in this world, whether it's in private industry or in public schools or university or kindergarten or whatever, that 80% of what goes on is teacher talk in a typical classroom. 10% is student talk. That is all the students together. And 10% is silence or confusion. Now, what you do with this instrument is to keep record every three seconds. You make a record of which category is happening in the classroom setting. And you can imagine the most common one is what I'm doing right now. Five, okay, lecture. It's the most popular method of teaching in the world. Now, I used to rail against the lecture based on research and all this sort of thing. But I have come to the conclusion recently that the lecture, anything that has survived that long and is that pervasive, must have an awful lot of power to it. And uh, so we're going to take another look at it. And uh, there are all different kinds of ways to lecture. I don't think we've studied uh, as, as much as we should. But that's the predominant teacher behavior. And it's, it doesn't make any difference whether you're in kindergarten or in, in graduate school. It essentially is the same. Now, so we, we have tallied. We've gotten tape recordings. And I would ask you this, or I, I would invite you to do this. If you would like your teaching to be analyzed by some people who, who've done that for people all around the world, you may send an audio tape recording of your teaching to us at Catholic University. I'll put the address up there in a little bit. Send us an audio recording, and we will rate it for you for, for these dimensions. Send it back to you free of cost. I'm not trying to sell anything. And uh, give you some feedback about what you do in your classroom setting, what actually happens. Now, why is this important? It's important for this reason, that we start then to get systematic feedback about what we're really doing in our teaching, <coughs> rather than what somebody thinks about our teaching. I did my student teaching in uh, Louisville, and uh, after I finished teaching my first class, I asked the teacher how it went, and she said, you played with the change in your pocket. And so I, I went up 100% the next time. I didn't fiddle with the change in my pocket. But it really didn't help me think about how I was helping people learn. Now this kind of an approach to looking at teaching begins to tell us descriptively what happened in the classroom rather than saying it's good or it's bad, but saying these are some things that went on. Now, we have a whole series of feedback systems that uh, we use, and we'll I'll give you a copy of them in just a minute. But, these are sheets that come back to you once we analyze the tape, and we, we ask you to put a code number on it. If you're going to send it to us rather than your name, send it to us. We rate it, send you back the sheet uh, with your scores on it, and you can see what you have done. Now, what would you do if you got it back and you found out that you talked 80% of the time and students talked 10? You might say to yourself, I don't like that. I would like to teach a different way. So then you have decided some way that you want to change. If you decide some way you want to change, then we have developed modules like this that teach you or help you as you go along to change some particular style or mode of teaching. This particular one is for increasing praise. If a teacher decides I'm not giving enough praise, here is a way, a teacher training procedure that you can go through to help you increase that. Now, does this module work? Well. Again, we do the same thing. We ask you to send a second tape. After you went through this, try to send us a second tape and see if that particular kind of behavior got better or, or higher, increased. If it did, then the training module has worked. And that's what we have done is how then can we give teachers feedback about their classroom <coughs> teaching, help them see what they're doing in a classroom, not to tell them it's good or it's bad, which always gets you in a fist fight with them, but simply say that's what you're doing to describe it then what would you like to change if you're dissatisfied with that? Then you would like to change in this direction. You would like to ask a more convergent question, more divergent questions, whatever it happens to be. And we try to set up training modules for that specific kind of behavior, but always in terms of what the teacher wants, not in terms of what we think they ought to be doing. We haven't found that to be very successful with uh, professors, particularly, haven't found it ever to be successful with anybody, but uh, particularly with professors. Now, people say, well, that's fine. We found out about uh, how people talk in a classroom setting. But what's really important about schools is are people thinking 
in a classroom setting. It's a cognitive level. We know all about the other. And uh, so we started off with Metfessel's scale, so there's 1,028 categories. And we began to rate classroom teaching every three seconds. And that <coughs> takes a lot of training to work with that. We found that it didn't tell us very much uh, from, a, from a statistic point of view. Now let me explain this to you. That whatever statement that, that, that we make about teaching, I have, we, we have some small studies that illustrate and so forth, but we have analyzed 200,000 hours of classroom teaching from kindergarten through medical school. And uh, so the, the things that we talk about, general principles that come from all of those tape recordings, and uh, so keep that in mind, if there is a massive uh, base of data, we have a ton, exactly a ton, we had to ship it about a year ago, so there's exactly a ton of data that we have that looks at classroom teaching. Now, Bloom's taxonomy of, of educational objectives is an instrument for measuring the cognitive components in the classroom, cognitive levels. It gives us six cognitive levels. We found that two of them tell us something, just two of them, okay? And so, using that, we set up this kind of scale. All right. The, now this tells us this, who, who are the people in the classroom who are doing the talking? Okay. Teacher and the student. Okay. One thing a teacher can do is to demonstrate knowledge of a fact, that she knows something, like I have been doing. Or you can solicit somebody else, or ask somebody else to give you a fact. Like if, some, if a teacher says, who, who discovered America, and somebody says Columbus, Okay, now that's a fact. So a teacher has demonstrated a fact and also has asked someone else for a fact. She then can use a fact, or what we call thinking. She can solve a problem, or he can solve a problem. Or they can ask someone else to solve a problem. Let me try to, try to illustrate the difference. If you say to someone, who, who discovered America? That has a straightforward answer to the convergent question. If you say, why did Columbus discover America? Then that has many different answers to it. And so you're asking a thinking question. And uh, so if we change our what, one thing we can learn in questioning, for instance, is to say, to change a what to a why. And the same teacher can, a, a student can do the same thing, the same cognitive act, which gives us eight different levels. And then we have, uh, have, have affective behavior, uh, and then silence or, or confusion on this scale. So it gives us a 10-point scale. Now, what does this tell us? It tells us about, or is the classroom just shooting the bull and having a good time, or is something happening at a cognitive level, such as problem solving, going on? We found this, that 80% of what goes on in a typical classroom is at a memory level, and 10% is at a thinking level, and all six categories of Bloom's taxonomy, and the 10% again is silence or confusion. So using these kind of nitty-gritty measures, we began to, to try to say, let's look at teaching. What is making what happen in a classroom? Is it how much the teacher talks? Does, does that affect thinking in a classroom, if that's what a teacher wants? Or what, what are the things that are causing things to happen? So we started some research on what we call the, the human dimensions. And Carl Rogers, in 1957, wrote an article called The Necessary and, and Sufficient Conditions for Constructive Personality Change. <coughs> he posited that there were three characteristics that made a difference in, in, in any human relationship, whether or not it was helpful to both people. First of all, he said empathy. Does one person understand the other? And can they communicate it? Secondly, was the person congruent? Was the person genuine, authentic? And thirdly, does the person have positive regard for the other person? Now, Roger said, if these conditions are present, that they are the necessary and sufficient conditions for constructive personality change, that they influence all learning relationships. So we began to take a look at that. If we could describe who was talking in a classroom for quantity, and if we could talk about the qualitative aspects of it, was there problem solving going on? What role then did, did a decent human relationship play? So we began to measure again, using the audio tape recordings, video tape recordings of classroom teaching, 
did it make a difference to, to, to the levels of empathy? Now, here was, here, here's the something like the scale that we use. A scale for empathy is a teacher communicating empathy to students. It said, if the teacher made no response to either the content or the feeling, that would be what we would call level one. If somebody says, is it raining outside, and you say, good morning, uh, you're missing both. If somebody says, I don't like arithmetic, and you say, uh, uh, arithmetic uh, is kind of hard for you, okay, then you're responding uh, to, to, to the youngster's feeling. It's difficult for you. What's difficult for you? Math is, is difficult for you. You're responding to both of them. Okay, so this can be learned and this can be trained for. Now, so response to feeling, response to why the person has the feeling is what we call level three. Level four is where we extend out the feeling and level five we give it, you know, that, that's, that's reserved for the gods when, when they give us an answer. Something like uh, when Jesus said to the Jews, thou hast said. Something that has a lot of meaning into it but take a long time to get the meaning out. We'd say that would be a level five response. So, so with empathy, <laughs> talking about do we understand how our students feel and do we communicate to them our understanding? This is the sort of thing that we're talking about. Uh, I know exactly how you feel and uh, I know you can uh, get the picture of why he would understand so much but he's obviously been in his shoes. Another one is don't be afraid to walk right in. Remember if it wasn't for us kids he'd be out of a job. So uh, it's all according to how you see things. Can you understand those rascals? Now we found this about the levels of empathy, and please hear this because we're going to break off in this this thing. The levels of empathy generally deteriorate across time during a school year. You are much less apt to have teachers making empathic responses to students in May than you are in September of the same academic year. Okay. Now, you are much less apt to get uh, a teacher's empathy Friday afternoon than you are Monday morning. Much less apt, okay? You are much less apt to get it at three in the afternoon than you are at eight in the morning, okay? So there is something about the way we function as human beings that makes a difference. I'm talking about how we are as a person makes a difference in how we function with other people. We followed this for three years with a very large group of students in Texas, and it holds up. Now, it, it makes a lot of common sense. I can see some of you smile. Now, what was the factor? Well, the factor was physical fitness. And so we began to take a look at teachers' physical fitness. Now, remember, we started in our quest on this thing with Metfessel scale, and now we're beginning to take a look at physical fitness. Okay. And we started to find some things. And let me just explain to you some of the kind of technology that we use. We, we had some, some little machines that you could tape to your chest, and it picks up your cardiogram, and a cardiogram goes out in the hall through a wireless sort of thing, and you have a machine out there that can pick up your cardiogram all day long. Okay, so we could tell what teachers were talking about, what they were doing, we could tell their heart rate, and uh, we, we could tell their, their respiration rate, and on and on. So we could begin to see what happened. Let, let me just give you one quick study. We did it on student teachers. Some of you are student teachers, I assume here. We found that student teachers uh, sig sig significantly deteriorate on physical indices during their student teaching. Okay, in other words, they get much less able to exercise and this sort of thing. It, it, it's, it's hard work to be in student teaching is what we found, okay? Now we found that by giving physical examinations to the people when they started and when they finished student teaching. I don't know whether that's discouraging or encouraging and so forth. But we found that this affected the way they operate in the classroom. And the tireder they are, the less functional they are in a classroom setting with some very sophisticated scientific uh, apparatus. Now, it made a difference then. Not did a teacher know how to be empathic, but could a teacher apply their empathy in the classroom setting? So we found a lot of people with skills, but who were pooped out, however you want to put it, and could not apply their skills. Now, we also found that it was possible to look at a teacher's skills before they entered the classroom and make a prediction about whether or not they could make 
some, some good responses to their students. If they had the basic skills, if they didn't, they could be trained to do so. They, they could be trained essentially for empathy. And that empathy does make a difference in how people learn. Now Virginia is a nurse, and uh, she's a very good nurse. And uh, I'm gonna ask her to talk to you about some of the physical studies that we have done and to uh, try to <coughs> illustrate, now starting with the cognitive dimension, moving to the <laughs> physical dimension, now we begin to take a look at what makes a classroom happen. That is, what are some components that make it a more decent place, okay? He talked about this as it relates to empathy, but we found that um, physical fitness um, worked the same way. So that in September, um, the teacher was uh, in better shape, as it were, um, and it got worse. Now, what we also found was that that teachers who were on a physical program of some kind, uh, a regular physical fitness program, whether it's uh, sit-ups, walking, running, you know, whatever, um, could indeed hang with the students longer. So that they came in higher in September. Uh, about December, you see there's a lag. First of the year, you get a little rise because they've had a little rest at December, uh, at Christmas. But they don't get up to, up to the September levels. And then it goes down uh, and so on. Found, as he also mentioned, during the week, on Monday, they were able to cope with the students. Uh, by Friday, they were usually, the students were climbing off the walls Uh, work um, fit in physical fitness uh, books he's put out called aerobics new aerobics aerobics for women anyhow one of the things that he says is a test a simple test of physical fitness is how long or uh, how far you can motor um, in uh, 15 minutes or 12 minutes excuse me and if you can do a mile and a half in 12 minutes, you're in pretty good shape. Now walk, run, crawl, or whatever. So what we did was, uh, and incidentally, I might say, all of these people were first checked out by a physician, and, and I feel very strongly about this, that you don't whip somebody out on the track and tell them to do a mile or two. That's uncool. Um, one of the things, every once in a while you hear so-and-so drop dead and, and they were uh, jogging or, or whatever. And what usually happens is this is somebody whose biggest activity all week is moving the pencil across the paper. And suddenly he realizes he's about to reach the big 5-0. And he thinks he ought to get back to um, his physical fitness level of when he was 18, 19 or whatever. So he decides, okay, this Saturday I'm gonna go out and play a couple of sets of tennis, uh, swim a few uh, laps, um, maybe uh, work in the yard and so on. Anyhow, what happens is he has a heart attack. Um, so I would say what, what we require, and, and I would say to any of you, don't start on a physical fitness program because sometimes we, we get to talking and we're so enthusiastic you can think, yeah, yeah, gee, that's really great. And that's not the thing to do, okay? So all of these students were first checked out by a physician so that they were physically okay to do this. And they went around the track, <clears throat> and as you can see, this was their level of fitness from fair to <laughs> very poor. At the end of their student teaching experience, um, there were no fairs, they were all very poor, and a couple of them couldn't even make it. There was just no way they could even make it for the post-test. So student teaching is a very difficult and a very wearing and very tiring thing. Um, and one needs to be physically fit to do it. All right. 
Now, we've got, we, we have a couple of uh, studies with, with cardiogram sort of thing here, but uh, we've talked at you and so forth, tried to throw out some kind of stimulus ideas. We'd like to have some questions and so forth as, as, as we go along here, and uh, some issues that you might want to raise and question about and so forth. Okay? And uh, we, as I said, we have looked at these dimensions uh, from kindergarten all the way through uh, grad school, and they are essentially the same. As there is not much difference in teaching performance at kindergarten and at graduate school. Okay? And uh, so we, we would like, is, is, is there any question now? We've been talking a long time and talking at you. Okay. Um, to what do you attribute the lowering of the physical condition? How does that, why does that go down so much? Well, several things. <laughs> One is the general tension within the student teaching experience. Uh, it's the most difficult teaching that I ever did. Okay. It was the least enjoyable. And uh, after 30 years, I can reflect back on that. I taught Sunday school at the time I was about 12. So I guess I go back and have about 35 years teaching experience. Uh, the other is you, you, you get so involved in student teaching that then you don't take care of yourself. And you begin to work up lesson plans at night and this sort of thing. And you just don't pay attention to the physical. By the way, this happens to most undergraduate students. Okay. Most undergraduate students are in worse condition when they finish, I'm talking about physically, when they finish their undergraduate program than when they start it. Most of them read less, too. Okay. Just a minute. Okay. I was working with a bunch of student nurses, and you know, we try to teach health and all the good things in life and so on. And we found they were in awful shape, just dreadful <coughs> shape. Well, it's because we work with them very hard. And I think student teachers are pretty much the same thing. Okay, yes. What can we teachers do to increase our empathy level towards the end of the day, or end of the week, or the end of the year? Okay, number one, there are two steps, I think, essentially to the program. Number one is to take training specifically in making empathic responses, or check out your skill, if you have the skill within your response repertoire. And uh, what we've done on that, the research we've done is this, that uh, making the, the empathic response consists of two things, responding to the feeling of the person and responding to the reason for the feeling. Okay. So I, I could say to you, you know, that you feel uh, kind, of, um, kind of in midair about how to apply this thing, okay? Responded to your feeling, responded to the reason for your feeling, okay? Now, so that's, in other words, just check on that skill. Can I do it? Can I make a response? Some kids say, I hate math. And you say, you're kind of turned off by math, okay? That's an empathic response, you have that. Then, once you know you can do it, then you say, okay, then I have to get in a good physical shape, a good physical exercise program. And that, that may sound kind of, of nitty-gritty, but that's just the way the data falls out. It's not my opinion. And by that, I'm talking about uh, Cooper's program, in which he says if you can run a mile and a half in 12 minutes, you're in pretty good physical shape. So the closer you can come to that. So that the other thing is, I think, to tape record yourself periodically and hear yourself teach and see if you really are making those responses. And what we say to most people, it's the most powerful in-service training tool I know anything about. It'll change more teacher behavior. And this, again, is not my opinion. It's just what happens. That they say, say, oh, oh well, what gives some gift to give us to see ourselves as others see us? And uh, finally, we have those things. And check and see. Just count the number of times that you make an empathic response in your teaching. So you give yourself feedback, which is the piece that's missing in most in-service training. Because we don't give feedback. We get training to do a certain thing, but we don't get feedback about whether or not we're using it. And there's been a lot of research on that that indicates that if we, if we teach something and people use it, that it works to the degree that it's applied, you know, which is what you would expect. Okay? Yes. Yeah. I'll put measures you have without getting too involved. Give a quick example of how you assess whether this really makes a difference or not. Yes. We, we gave uh, tests, pre and post testing, okay? And we have some teachers making high-level high responses, many empathic responses, and others not making any. So we use two c control groups across every grade level that we've ever worked with, okay? And we, we looked at, at, at achievement test scores, we look at IQ scores, 
We looked at attendance. We looked at discipline problems. We looked at attitude toward school. We looked at self-concept measures. We looked at attitude toward teachers, of teachers' attitude toward students. Those were some of the outcome variables that we used, everyone we could think of. And uh, wh where we had, had higher levels of, of empathy, we had higher student attendance. We had higher teacher attendance. We had higher uh, learning rates as measured by, by standardized achievement tests. We had higher, higher IQ change. We, we worked with some youngsters in Orange County, Florida, and uh, the, the kids made a 10-point gain in, in, in their Stanford BNA scores. 25 youngsters, this was a well-controlled study. So we, we've looked at those things. With undergraduate schools, we've looked at achievement, pre and post testing across sections of a course and across the whole course, and we've found the same thing. That if you uh, keep track of the teachers that respond empathically to their students, that those who, who uh, give empathic responses pretty frequently will get more learning from their students than those who don't. And that holds up in the, whether you use standardized tests or teacher-made tests, the same thing. If you do pre and post testing, attendance is the same way. It's okay? Uh, we, we, use, we use MTAI, the MMPI, the OPI, and on and on. Every test that we could use. And they, if it shows difference, it's clear. Okay? Yes? Uh, when you send a tape recording in, how long approximately does it take to get your response back? What we try to do is to give two-week turnaround on that. With the videotape, it's harder to do. With an audio tape, it's simple to get done. And let me uh, strongly recommend this, that this is something you can do for yourself. Audio tape record your teaching. Listen to yourself. And, and what we found is if you listen to five minutes of yourself and you can stand it, okay, <laughs> usually you're shocking. And, and I'm, I'm very sincere. We've had teachers faint while listening to themselves for the first time. And uh, that's kind of extreme, but that happens. A big confrontation with self. In five minutes, if you make that, then listen to 10, then listen to 15, so you can hear yourself teach. Then you can begin to rate yourself. And our preference is to teach you these scales, philanders and so forth, and let you rate yourself, because you get immediate feedback. And many teachers around the country, college and, and otherwise, train a student to sit in, in, in the back of the class and rate them while the class is going on, so they get feedback as soon as the class is over, a student hands them the sheet, the tally sheet. And you can train junior high school students to do this kind of work. You can train high school students, and it works. And it will help to change teacher behavior in the direction they want to go. If I tell you that lecturing is bad, you'll, you'll do more lecturing, by the way. If you decide lecturing is bad or whatever, then you'll change it. So, so we, we strongly recommend that you record yourself, give yourself feedback, carry on your own in-service training program. It's free, it's cheap to, yes? Anything, anything with um, older teachers or teachers that have had more experience? And I was wondering if they would level off or if the same trend holds true. Age is, is a relative, first of all. There are some people who are old when they're five and some people are young when they're 90. Bernard Baruch learned to type when he was 90. And uh, so age, in, in all of our studies, doesn't cook out as a factor in anything. And uh, uh, teachers can learn and train and change their behavior at any age, or they can not learn and change it at any age. It's true with everyone. And uh, if you keep, what we did in, in Texas was to tape record every teacher in the school and to give them feedback daily. And we noticed that empathy went down in the school precipitously, boom. And we called the principal and asked him what happened. He said, I don't know, nothing yet. But about two days later, they had a riot, a rape, and a stabbing in the school. So, so these things are, are predictive. That is, when, the, when people quit getting along with each other, bad things are going to happen in that environment, and you can make predictions. And uh, so they pay attention to us the next time. You know, we call them and said, hey, something's happened. Then they started getting around talking to the students, and uh, sure enough, there were some tensions in the school they started working on. But um, yeah, schools tend to get less nice places to be uh, the, the longer you're at it. 
and thank God for the Christmas break and <laughs> Easter and spring vacation and so forth. And he did. This is not true for the very physically fit. The very physically fit teacher, let me just say this. The average teacher's pulse is 120 while they're teaching, okay, in our study. 120 while you're in active teaching. The average rate is 80, about. Okay, so you you accelerate quite a bit while you're teaching. Pretty stressful occupation. If if you're physically fit, your pulse will go to about 70 or 75. Okay, so it isn't a stress when you can hang in there longer. And uh, uh, most of the studies of cardiovascular functioning find the same thing whether you're in a parenting relationship or in a in a teaching relationship or a counseling relationship. That uh, physical fitness gives you some kind of reserve that you don't move around as much inside yourself, you know, you don't have as much biochemistry to deal with as when you're not physically fit. Yes? Do you think then that a, um, a school system that was set up like to go six weeks and have a two week break, go all year long like that would be more conducive to learning than with, with these little breaks in between to possibly gain better physical fitness? I don't know whether well, the break had to give us some kind of reprieve when we're not physically fit. Is that clear? The break gives us some kind of reprieve when we're not basically physically fit. The best thing to do would be, you, you, you probably could go right on studying and right on learning and so forth if we stay physically fit. If that were a part of the, the school program to stay physically fit, that, that that would be the best learning environment we could have internally, okay? And that to taking the breaks is just like running a mile. If you're not in very good physical shape, you know, you have to stop about every lap and take a deep breath, or several of them. But if we stay physically fit, we can stay with a mile. And uh, so that's, I think the answer would be, yeah, if we're not physically fit, take breaks, you know, every time you need them, every other day, maybe, or something like that. But, but another solution might be to, put, to uh, <coughs> help teachers and prospective teachers become physically fit. And start early. You know, the younger you start, the more apt you are to stay with it. It's probably not <coughs> not as vital uh, for younger people because they they're pretty resilient and they can do a lot of bad things to their body, and the body will bounce back. But the older you get and the grayer you get, uh, the less apt you are to bounce back. So that. If you start on a physical fitness program early, then it gets to be a way of life. And then when you do need it, you've got it. Does that make sense? But what you said a little bit ago about the increase in the heartbeat, mm. you don't have to jog, just teach. And your heart gets that exercise. That's the reason teaching is such a That's partially true. Another aspect of that is when you jog, you break down adrenaline. And when you just teach, you don't. You accumulate it. Oh, so when you teachers say that adrenaline flow in teaching is an important factor. It is, <laughs> but uh, the average teacher, it is. It is. You have to get up for teaching. See, you can't but get angry. You can't make love. You can't do a lot of things without that. <laughs> <laughs> when you're making love, then you're, you're using up the adrenaline. So when you finish, your pulse goes back down. And when you run the same thing, when you finish running, your pulse will drop back down. And if you stay physically fit, it will, of course, stay down. You build up a tolerance for adrenaline. And uh, so th that's the advantage of exercise. When a, when a teacher finishes, her, her pulse will stay up about an hour and a half for, so after the teaching day, or he, man or woman. Okay? So uh, the, the a big advantage of exercise is that you create a tolerance for adrenaline, your pulse does not go as high, and apparently that's good for longevity. Yes? Somebody had any questions on him? I, I have one. Okay. Ms. Holman, when you were asking about uh, age <coughs> and your test, it would seem like age and physical fitness would go. It, it, as you got older, you would tend to find more people who were less physically fit, and therefore that would affect. That's true, but this is a changing concept in our uh, group, okay? That they're, they're finding now that, that Dr. Cooper's work down in Dallas and so forth is that uh, people can run a mile in, in, in a half in 12 minutes in, into their 80s. I, I think that's right Yeah. But and I, go ahead. I thought if you're studying the situation as it, as it exists, then you tend to find a correlation between age and uh, 
this this line that we had was physical fitness coming down to the year. Right. But this can be changed yeah. if we begin an exercise program. So those teachers who have maintained an exercise program do not fit the curve, and they are the exception. And uh, so it isn't, we, we don't have to be old at, you know, 22 or something to say. Apparently we, we, we can go ahead to, to sustain life you know, for a long time. It's a very healthy area. But, but you're right. We, we, we tend to get more sedentary as we go along, but it is possible to intervene in that curve. And see, the, the payoff is this, is that, that when we're not tired, we're more decent, apparently. We, we use our skills, and when we're more decent, people learn more. So that's the equation. I'm not trying to sell jogging or anything else, or exercise. I'm simply saying if we're a teacher and we want good learning, that that's a thing we should bring to the learning situation with us. Yes? How much have you done to study the other elements in this environment, in addition to the teaching? and the interaction in the classroom. I am wondering if there is a tremendous influence from those extraneous matters or interactions that are outside of the classroom. How much have you done to study the impact of that on one's interaction with the student in the classroom? In our studies, what we've tried to do is to control for these. In other words, we tried to match schools and subjects so we could look at the variables that we wanted to study. But we also know this, that uh, you can uh, take a school and match it with another for all the indices that you can think of and find differences between them, one, one being a decent school to go to and the other not being so hot. Then if you train in the one that's not so hot, those obstacles get to be overcome. Okay. It is possible for a human environment, a good school environment, to overcome a lot of negative things in the town. Okay, uh, it, and um, let me let me just say this: If I were going to take a job now, the first person I would talk to would be the principal. Okay, of the school, because you can you can interview the principal. If the principal has been there for more than three years, and make all kinds of predictions about the school. The same thing is true for department heads chairmen, deans of colleges, and so forth, that they will attract to themselves people like themselves. This is what the data shows. And that if you're in a, a, a bad situation, one is causing you to come apart to seem, uh, you know, you had best look around at the people surrounding you and so forth. Well, the same thing is true with the school in a, in a poor situation that, that you can think of. A good school in a poor situation changes, reverses a lot of things. That, uh, that are really associated with poverty or, you know, all the bad things we can think of. It is possible to turn that around. And it has been done. And we've seen a school in, in Maryland go from last place, Montgomery County, Maryland, go, go from last place in school achievement and discipline and so forth to fourth place among something like 75 schools by training the teachers, training the parents, training the kids. So it is possible to turn a situation around. It takes about three years to do that, too to accumulate a, a, a situation that's a good learning environment for people. Same thing is true for medical schools, the same thing is true for MIT. Let me, let me just say this, <laughs> uh, we, we did a study with the students at, at MIT, and we found out that during the five years they were there, that their muscles get tighter and tighter and tighter, and when they're graduated, they're really tight, okay? So physiologically, they lay the basis for ulcers and headaches and all this sort of thing. Well, they've learned a lot of things, too. But among the things they've learned is how to get tight in a tense situation. They're doing a lot of things to try to reverse that. And they have more people involved in athletics at MIT than any other school in the country. And uh, so they're, they're, they're aware of the problem. But we, 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 we learn many things simultaneously. And apparently one of the things we learn is you know, how to love reading, how to love or hate it, and how to, to love each other or hate each other to compete with each other or to help each other. And uh, those are all things that we learn in school situation, and they can all be reversed uh, if we can work with the faculty, whether it's at a college level or at a kindergarten level. I was just gonna respond to that. We have a friend in um, the principal in Montgomery County, Maryland, who has been in three different elementary schools. And he goes to one, and he, after he's there for a while, he, he gets the faculty on physical programs and the school gets to moving and they're doing good things. And they move him to another school because they're convinced 
that it's not him, but there's something special in the school. So they moved him to another school. Now he's working on his third school, and each time it comes out being really a top-notch school where it started down low. So it does make a difference. Okay, one more question. Yeah. Um, I've been reading some of the schools that have had some real student-teacher problems. That they started teaching courses in ethics, and this seems to make quite a difference in the response teacher students to teacher mm -hmm. thing. Now, do you tie that in with your definition of decency, or is that working together in your mind? Or? That would be a part of decency, certainly. Uh, ethics, um, ethics be kind of left out in the most situations. We haven't come at it through the ethics uh, set, but I know where ethics are taught. That ethics make a difference too, and how people relate to, to each other. But but the thing that they lack then is the actual skill. If that's not taught, you understand, people can have very good ethics with each other, very good feelings for each other. You know, lo love the human race and this sort of thing. But we found that unless somebody teaches us specifically how to make an empathic response, how to to express our positive regard for the person, these sorts of things, that, that, that the skill level is missing. Like somebody can teach me for, for a weekend to love reading, but unless they give me the skill to read, I go, I fall right back to the low level that I had before because there isn't a skill level to sustain it, okay? So the, the cognitive maps and this sort of thing give us some kind of target to hit, but they don't give us the means for getting to the target. Unless somebody <coughs> fills in those with skills, then we fall back, apparently. And you can do lots of things at a cognitive level. This, this is part of it. But unless they have the skills to buttress them, then you slide backwards, at least that's what we've found. Okay? They're, they're a piece of the puzzle, but without a skill, skill un underlay, then they're just, just insufficient. Okay? All right, we're going to stop. Uh, you've been a good and patient group. And we'll, we'll do this. We'll, we'll stick around up here after as long as you want to talk and uh, we got some skills and all this sort of thing that we can uh, work and if you want to gather up here and chat with us we'll stick around and talk. Uh, now let me offer this to you. If you want to improve your teaching, okay, take a look at your own teaching, take a look at it uh, through some systematic feedback sort of thing and if you don't do anything else, count the amount of time you talk and the amount of time your students talk. Okay. And keep track of that, and that makes all kinds of good differences in learning. That's the beginning. And uh, so if you're interested in uh, finding out more about some of the sort of things we've done, uh, we're, we're here, we'll stay here, and we'll answer some of your questions and dialogue with you and so forth as long as you want to stick around. we got a room right upstairs. And, uh, but to be empathic with you, uh, you've got some things that you have to do, some of you. I can tell the anxious look on your face. And uh, you have been patient and good, and uh, so we thank you. And uh, if you would like to dialogue with us, if anybody here would like to look at some of the numbers that we have, we have some some statistics here. And let me, let me just say this: okay. we we have done multivariate analyses, we have done discriminative function analyses, we have done the most complicated statistics that I know anything about, modified Markov processes, and so forth. And the data holds up. They challenged the data. They said being decent in a classroom doesn't make one whit of difference in Germany and Israel. Okay, so they replicated our study in Germany and replicated our finding. They replicated our study in Israel and replicated our finding. So it's, it, it holds up in three cultures. It holds up in the north. It holds up in the south. It holds up in the east. It holds up in the west of this country. Okay, so it, it has a good, a good base for a good statistical base, a good theoretical base. Okay? And if you want some of that information, we have it here. If you want some more information, we'll give it to you. We'll stick and talk long enough. Yes? But you scare me a little bit. Okay. <laughs> the reason you scare me is that you're talking mainly about procedure. Mm -hmm. And most of the research shows, uh, for example, in counseling, that the person is more important than the procedure he uses. Now, I know you think that too, or you wouldn't be talking about decency in the classroom, that that teacher's personality there is probably the most effective thing. Now, I heard Flanders in one of his early studies saying 
oh, that if they could just get the children's participation up to 10% in the classroom, that he would be satisfied at that time. Now, I don't know what the scale is now. I haven't heard him. 20%. Well. What? <laughs> I don't know. But he, 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 when he first started, it was only 3%. His first measurement was mm -hmm. only 3%. Uh, uh, it's the importance of the individual, the teacher. And uh, that, I came over here to hear you say that tonight. Okay. <laughs> totally agree. But let me say this, that, uh, that to, to have a really good, authentic person teaching, it takes good parents, it takes good friends, it takes a good community and so forth, and not a lot of people get that, okay? But a person can know it and, and not have, have had good parents, not have had a good school, okay? And so they start, they say, that's something that I want to do. And so they need some handles to get a hold of as they go from their own experience. And most of us had bad experiences in school. Almost everybody here had some terrible experience in their own learning environment. Some of us had good parents, some of us had some bad parents, so forth. But if I move now toward becoming more decent as a person, okay, I sometimes need handles. Okay, little thing. I know I'm doing it this way. One day, when I'm trying to get people to talk more, I hear their soul. Okay, and that's when I make the high level response. But I have to have some handles to make it safe while I'm getting over there. Okay, and so this is what this is. And I, I, I fully concur that a good, loving teacher with, who's smart, educated himself, who's had good parents, who has had good food, who has had good teachers, who has had a good community, is that kind of person. Unfortunately, there aren't a lot of us, of us, them. <laughs> but if we choose to become more constructive with people, our set has been, let's now have some hands. Let me quote this, Carl Rogers took the same stance not too long ago, and he said he didn't understand it because he preferred to do the group encounters and this sort of thing but he saw that there was a need to have handles for people to hold on to and that they then could integrate. Now, to me, this is this all close to this, but if, as a teacher, okay, but when I was talking to this gentleman, I don't know, he's a good man, tell me looking at him, but when I was talking to him, everybody in this room was listening, okay, and if you can remember that in your teaching, if you touch one person, okay, you've touched a group, and if you haven't, then you've missed a group, and that's what he's talking about. Okay, if you'd like to talk with us, why come up and we'll check. <laughs>